spring semester of the uh, Center for Climatic Research's Climate, People, and Environment Program seminar series. So we have another great semester of uh, talks. And if you don't know who I am, I'm on for this sign. I helped organize this seminar along with Aaron Smith. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to have our first speaker give some really interesting talks about sea level, something I know very little about, but I'm really excited to learn more. Uh, that's Peg P of our, from uh, CCR. Um, before we get started, just now, we do have a couple traditions in the CPAP seminar series that we've started this year. One is, you might have noticed there's no coffee and cookies at the beginning of the talk because what we try to encourage people to do is to come over across the street to Union South after the talk. And I think Bank is available today, so even though it's not an out-of-town speaker, uh, we will work make our way over after this talk and probably be there for you know, 30, 40 minutes. And if you show up early enough, then the beer's on me. So um, <laughs> please come over. This is and yeah, this is a great tradition. We also have another tradition, which is it's perfectly fine to ask clarifying questions during the talk, but we do want to prioritize giving students an early career scientist the opportunity to ask questions at the end. So. If you're dying to ask a question, just I'll ask for those first, but then feel free to ask away as much as you want afterwards. But I just want to encourage as much discussion as we can, given that this is usually a pretty modest sized seminar designed to really help pursue ideas. And finally, if you are interested in some point in this semester, or well, this semester we're full, but in the upcoming year or next year, in giving a CPOP, CPAP talk, either because you have some fun results coming out, or you've gotten some recent funding or a recent paper. Uh, just let me know. Uh, we will start scheduling relatively soon. Uh, we may be doing something different a little bit with next spring where we're going to try to uh, focus on polar climates uh, to line up with our new cluster hires. Uh, but uh, stay tuned for more information on that. And with that, I'm going to pass it off. I got the Fang CV here in case you don't know. Uh, you've been here. Uh, for, for, for a number of years. Uh, I'm sorry, can you announce one of the Yeah, go ahead, announcements, go ahead. Yeah, so just probably most people are aware, but you have the cluster hires starting next week, Mondays right. and Tuesdays. Good point. Um, in geosciences, in AOS, and then a cross environmental search on the ecology side. Right. So you'll, you're, we'll be having three candidates come in on Mondays and Tuesdays every week for February with the individual research talks on Monday afternoons. And then they sort of panel clustered Correct. panels Tuesday afternoon. Correct. So at the time in weeks hall. Correct. In hall, right? Correct. So that is going to be the next three CPEP time slots. Four. four. Yeah. All right. Four. However many there are, <laughs> I can't count. Uh, so yeah, actually, before we sorry to take up a little bit of time. Yeah. So starting next week, that will be uh, the next four talks will be these uh, CPEP uh, or there'll be these speed talks with the three candidates over in weeks hall. So please go to those. Um, don't go here, because there'll be nobody here. Um, I should point out that next week, CPEP, to, uh, to accommodate that, we are moving the, our guest uh, out-of-town speaker from uh, Natasha McBean from uh, University of Indiana. She'll be speaking at 11 a.m. in this room on carbon cycles and carbon cycle data assimilation. Um, that's actually joint with the bioclimatology class, grad class that I teach, so there will be some students here as well, but please, it'll be open to everyone. There'll be 11 a.m. in this room as well next week. Okay, so Fang, Fang, Fang. Uh, Fang has been here at the Center for Climatic Research as an associate scientist uh, currently. Um, got his bachelor's degree in marine science from Ocean University of China, and then came here to UW Madison way back in 2008, so we're just about, uh, or 2007, I guess, about the same year that I got here. And got his master's and PhD, uh, and then stuck around to do a postdoc in paleoclimate work, went to Oregon State uh, as a NOAA Global Change Fellow. Uh, for several years and then came back here as a scientist in CCR and since that time he's published numerous papers including a number of really uh, interesting high impact papers on uh, paleoclimate models that run some of the most extensively long paleoclimate models I've ever heard of and I think today we'll hear a little bit about some of that about discussions about higher global sea level during the last interglaciation so that I'll pass it on to you. Thank you Andrew, for the wonderful introduction. So since I know uh, most of you, so we can make it really informal and clear uh, ask questions so everyone can benefit from the more in-depth discussion. Uh, however, I want to emphasize that uh, the sea level rise is a very serious problem. And I will show you uh, very soon. So, so far, we have already seen about like uh, 20 to 25 centimeters sea level rise in the past 130 years. 
So uh, this record goes from 1888 to Lucky which was only 10. Um, it's about 8 to 9 inches, and uh, you might feel it might not be uh, such big. It's only like uh, that much. However, I will show you uh, uh, the impact of CO right is very broad and uh, sometimes very serious. So the more, so those are the major uh, impacts from the CO right. So shoreline erosion and the degradation and the amplified storm surge and then the, the permanent uh, inundation. And, and then I will show you uh, salt water uh, intrusion. So do you know what percentage of American population live near the coast? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How near the coast? How near the coast? 50%. Uh, but like a live near the the county of the coast. Okay. Coastal county. Yeah, ninety percent. Sixty percent. This is the number. So seventy nine percent. But that number is being like a two thousand ten. Uh, so, oh, but you don't have to uh, like live near the beach to feel the impact. For example, I mentioned there's uh, salt water in Chile. I, I mean, it's pretty far from the, you know, the seashore. But uh, however, with the sea level rise, just a little bit, actually the water will get into the typical, the get into the fresh water for a while. So that, that's one impact that uh, you might not see, but uh, it, it could be very serious. And then another one is this uh, high tide flooding. And uh, actually you met notice uh, from last month about this uh, uh, high tide flooding in Venice. It's estimated that uh, over one billion in damage to see the home and uh, historical sites. So, and then <coughs> this is the picture uh, in uh, Nadi in 2015. So what is this uh, high flood, uh, high tide flooding? So basically before the sea level rise, so you only, I mean, basically uh, you have to have storm surge to push the water like uh, uh, go on the, the streets. However, with the sea level rise, now, you don't need a storm surge to achieve that. If you have a high tide, then the water will get on the streets. And the frequency of a tide is definitely much more than storm surge. That's why uh, this is the uh, data to show that uh, um, in the past 30 years, the frequency of this high tide flooding actually doubled. And this is the same curve we saw about this uh, 25 centimeter rise of sea level. And this is the, the high tide flooding. So like, um, here it's maybe around like one or two. Now it's getting to three or four times a year. And also this is like on average for all the coastal cities. If you were, you were in uh, Miami, the frequency might jump even higher. Uh, okay, so what's called in the sea level to rise? So right now, actually, more of the sea level rise came from this uh, thermal expansion of the sea water. Basically, if the water get warmer, then it, it, it's fine, then the sea level right here. And then the total of uh, the estimation of the sea level rise from thermal expansion is about, uh, about 0.4 meter per degree of global warming. And then the second contribution is from this mountain glacier and the ice caps. It's estimated that globally it's only about 0.6 meter. 
And then this is a big, big factor. This is the elephant in the room. So for the ice sheet, it can contribute six meters from Greenland, 60 meters from Antarctic. Uh, for Antarctic, um, three meter CO rise can occur if the Western Antarctic ice sheet uh, collapses. And um, now let's uh, look at one thing that's a little bit alarming, definitely, is right now the CO rise is accelerating because more and more contribution from mounting uh, land ice. And uh, so this is uh, the similar CO rise curve with the units in inches. And uh, you can see a little bit the, the, the rise is starting to go up. The, you know, the gradient, the read of the CO rise started to increase. And then this is the, the kind of comparison of the, so this is the almost like 35 year um, kind of a calculation for the, for the grid of sea level rise. Here, thermal expansion contributes this much. Then this is from melting land ice. However, if you do the same calculation of grids of sea level rise, you can see with, with the later half the record, you can see the land ice is contributing more and more. So is that yeah. inferred from, say, see, basically taking double sea level and subtracting what you would expect from the expansion? Or how do they measure land ice sea level? Uh, it's from the, the Paris satellite. Okay. So it can measure the as in gravitational chain or geopotential. Oh, okay. And it, it's, uh, yeah, that's that's enough to figure out how much land ice is contributing. Well, they can also calculate the heat content, right? And just sure. calculate the thermal. Oh, that's what I was thinking, right? Yeah. Thermal. Yeah. I was just wondering if, you know, if it was a residual, just how much uncertainty is there in thermal expansion? I seem like there's been a lot of papers suggesting lots of deep ocean warming that we don't account for. Yeah. yeah. Even for this thermal expansion, the uncertainty is on average point four. But I think it's like from 0.2 to 0.6, okay. depending on which model you are using. And uh, even in that model, what kind of uh, circulation you get, uh, depending on different kind of uh, of, the, of the model. Um, yeah, definitely there are a lot of uncertainty here. Uncertainty here. Uh, however, those uncertainty a much, much smaller if you look at this activity as mean from the civil rights scenario for the end of this century. So the lowest estimate, basically kind of an interpolation, uh, is an extension of this uh, baseline civil rights of the, the past. It's 0.2 meter. However, there you get like a two meter of civil rights at the end of this century. And this is based on this new uh, kind of uh, uh, synthesis in 2012. So basically, they commented that at this stage, the greatest uncertainty surrounding estimate of the future global sea level is from the ice sheet loss, primarily, primarily from Greenland and West Antarctica. And uh, you can tell it's really hard for people to do, like uh, for the facility or infrastructure to do planning if they uh, face this kind of uncertainty for the future civil life. And this figure is in 2012. So let's look at the figure, the number last year. So this is uh, a kind of a structured expert judgment. Basically, it's kind of an expert assessment. Uh, their conclusion is, first, they commented that uh, the potential contribution of ice sheets remain the largest source of uncertainty in projecting future civil rights. So then they, they 
basically a provide a consistent, consistent number for the future sea level rise of about two meters for the end of this century at the their upper bound, the 95th uh, percentile. So at, at the end of this century, so this uh, two meter sea level rise, sea level rise is still uh, cannot be ignored. And in addition, uh, right now more and more people are realizing that uh, this upper bound is not totally useless. I mean, maybe sometimes it's, it's more important for the planning purpose. It's like, uh, you know, you go out to buy a sandwich, you have to know uh, or you go to a grocery to do some shopping, you take some cash. You have to estimate like, uh, the upper bound. So this is the same kind of uh, philosophy. You, you have to know like, uh, how much you, 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 you might expect. Otherwise, if you build something and uh, you cannot use the average like, suitable right for your planning because there is a very large possibility it will fall uh, it will be over the, the average value. And also they actually give another uh, prediction for like the 22nd century. What they estimate is about 7.5 meters of sea level rise can be, uh, can be as a result of the instability of the uh, both Western and uh, Eastern Antarctic. So here, let's uh, do a summary of our current and future sea level rise. So currently, what's already happened is uh, only about 20 to 25 centimeters. However, that number is increasing and uh, the change is, is accelerating. And then we are facing this uh, huge uncertainty of uh, the civil right at the end of this century because we basically just don't know what the both Greenland and Antarctic actually will behave. Why no? And I'm sure the rest of your talks are going to tell us about that. But why uh, actually, you? no. This is the exact uh, question I want to ask. Oh. <laughs> Any recommendation? <laughs> what needs to be done? <laughs> Good. <laughs> you seem to know a lot about where it's going to warm up and with some bounds in a lot of different parts of the globe. Why don't we know that over the Greenland and Antarctica? It's not so much the uncertainty in how much it's going to warm, it's the uncertainty and stabilities in the ice sheet. So where is the grounding line that keeps them, where is that location in the ice sheet where the grounding line is? And, and what's the stability of that slope? And that's not well known. Um, and how come that's not well known? Well, it's probably, they probably have the, the slope right, but then it depends how the ocean and the ice interact, how fast things can retreat how, if the ice sheet is in an unstable grounding zone line. Um, there's also, I think, something called a marine ice cliff instability, something like that. I forget exactly what that one is, where the ice cliffs start. Um, I can speak to that. Yeah, basically, <laughs> basically, you know, the, the new ice model physics are trying to model the process of an ice sheet sort of crumbling backwards. And mm -hmm. as it keeps losing its buttress, the next clip collapses. And it's a much faster rate. So new models have brought that in to just a much faster rate of ice loss into the ocean when you have this sort of cliff instability mechanism. And there's people written back saying, no, no, that doesn't make any sense. So that's a, it's a real argument right now, the ice modeling. Okay, so it's not really melting the way that you colloquially no. talk about melting on the street. Right. It's, it's crumbling. Right, there's and destruction. You think about mass balance, like there's a top mass balance, and that's relatively easy. You, you know the ambient temperature, you can measure mass loss at the top of the ice sheet. What's really hard is the subsurface. Is it melt water contact that, that creates a lubricated bottom for the ice sheet? And then the ice ocean contact, and our ocean surface is changing, what's happening underneath that ice margin? The shelf buttress crumbles away. That's all the stuff that's really uncertain. Okay. Yeah. And there's a lot of people in here who know about that. That's my recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it should be discussed. Yeah, it does seem like it's, you know more than just melting. It's, it really is as much more about the ocean, right, ice interface, than it is about air. It, this this is a good segue to next month because the next four hires are all going to be in this space on the geosciences side. So I have uh, Luke Zut, uh, professor in weeks in geoscience. 
he studies um, another important component, and it's like the coefficient of friction on the bottom of the ice sheet. And and there's there's no, no idea what the land surface yeah, is, what the that. materials are, what mm -hmm. the material properties are, how ice slides over that, yeah. what happens if it's wet or not. Yeah. Uh, it, it, so there are all kinds of okay. things that's, that go into this. But yeah. Very yeah, and also the timing. I mean, if we get 5 degrees, 6 degrees global warming, we know Greenland will be gone. However, it will be gone in 100 years. 1,000 years, I mean, that, yeah. that's yeah. another question, right? Yeah, yeah. so uh, I, I think this, uh, this trend and response uh, is it, really hard. Yeah. So when was the last time Greenland and ice sheet and Antarctica ice sheet caused sea level to rise over seven and a half meters? So let, let's uh, see a little bit the uh, yeah, recent climate future. And we know the words is 4.5 billion years old. So this is 400,000, so that's pretty recent. So this is basically four uh, glacial, interglacial cycles. And uh, so this is uh, interglacial. So we are looking at the CO2 on the top, Antarctic temperature on the bottom. I mean, mainly this figure just show you uh, CO2 and Antarctic temperature has such a good correspondence. But here I just show you, uh, so this is the interglacial. This is the kind of glacial. So this is our current uh, like, uh, interglacial. This is uh, the last interglacial. So that happened about 125,000 years ago. Our current interglacial started about 11,500 years ago. So now we know the the terminology. Now let's look at the, the synthesis of the sea level rise. Um, the comparison between last in the glacial and, uh, and uh, this is 2014, year 2014. So uh, this synthesis is more than just last in the glacial, but let's focus on this one. So at uh, 125,000 years ago, which is also when the early humans started to move out of Africa. So we, we get like six to nine meters higher sea level than year 2014. So that's uh, based on like 28 paper and uh, a census. And uh, this is, uh, um, yeah. So this is, those uh, the census is based on. So 28 paper, like the uh, first 14 is for the total sea level at last in the glacial. And then they say the another 14 is from the Greenland ice sheet. And uh, so for Greenland, it's done pretty only recently, starting at 2000. For the global, you can see uh, some work was done like 30 years ago. But uh, you can see uh, starting in 1998, and uh, the estimate of total global sea level at last in the glacial, basically it just increasing. And uh, from like four meter to like a seven and a half meter. So based on the, the recent several papers, seven and a half on average, like uh, between six and nine meters is our best estimate right now. Um, sorry. Yep. What's the source for this? Is, where, where does the figure come from? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's from uh, actually. Let me see. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have uh, a reference. Yeah, it's from Dom and all 2015. Uh, Andre, Andre, Yes. Um. So. And uh, if you look at uh, the Greenland, so basically the Greenland, the number for Greenland is just going down from like uh, ice free, like six, five, six meter, right now to like only two meter on average, based on the, the most recent census. Sorry, Tom. Yeah. So you're saying the most recent census Greenland, when it's completely ice free, will only contribute. Like yeah, I'm sorry, maybe I did not uh, 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 frame it uh, 
accurately. So what I mean is, uh, like starting in 2000, the estimate is uh, ice free. Then like uh, right now, the estimate is only like two meters. The Greenland is only contributing two meters. Oh, I suppose like I'm sort of like seven meters that people usually. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's this is uh, the estimate that uh, the Greenland actually survived the last integration. Oh, okay. It was not totally like uh, melting away. It's only melting uh, about uh, one third. So this applies more. We have now. We now think that we are more stable than we used to think. Yeah. We also think that Antarctica is less stable than we used to think. Yeah. So that's kind of the basically the the typical message. Is, uh, yeah. Basically, what you say. <laughs> <laughs> Antarctica is definitely not stable. I mean, this is even right now we don't have a record for the collapse of uh, Western Antarctic history. I know under Taiwan, but still, <laughs> the paper is not out yet. Okay, so another summary. So 4.5 meter from the melting of the Antarctic ice sheet. And um, that means you have a total collapse of three meter from the Western Antarctic ice sheet. And then, Another 1.5 meter from the melting of a land based uh, eastern Antarctic ice sheet. Then 2 meter from Greenland. And then 1 meter from this uh, thermal expansion and then the mountain glacier. So you know, like, uh, the total, basically, that means the 0.6 meter of mountain glacier is all gone, plus 1 degree warming that gives you 0.4 meter of uh, Thermal expansion, uh, that's the, the one meter. Okay, let's uh, take a look at this uh, based on from a different perspective, from the climate forcing and the sea level response perspective. So here you, we see for the climatic forcing for the sea level or for the melting of the glacier. So you got about six to nine meters sea level rise. However, the warming is the same. It's one degree. So that means uh, it's not like uh, we have a higher sea level because our climate is warmer. Even more so is for the CO2. Because at the last interglacial, the CO2 is basically the, the background the interglacial CO2 level. However, at 2014, our CO2 is 400 ppm. So this higher sea level, definitely not from higher CO2 from last integration because the CO2 is, was not higher at last integration. Yeah, say that, yeah, that's the setting. <laughs> so, I mean, for me as a climate scientist, this is really, really, Dark, right? You have a six to nine meter higher sea level at the last in the glacial, you are not warmer, and your CO2 is lower. So, <laughs> wow, that's, uh, that's interesting. So, what's causing the sea level to rise at six to nine meter at the last in the glacial with the lower CO2 and uh, the same amount of global warming? Any suggestion? It's just CO2 is going up so fast right now that they yeah. the inertia. That's what I, I, I wrote here. So is that just because uh, it's uh, just a matter of time? And then uh, one degree global warming will cause like a six to nine meter of sea level rise given sufficient time? I mean, it's a pretty good argument to me. <laughs> I always thought, I mean, when people invoke Greenland more, that they invoked a higher summer insulation during that last summer glacial, slightly different global configuration. But now that Antarctica is coming up, yeah, it does seem like a puzzle. Where, how do, why do you think that Antarctica is so stable in the back? Yeah. Configuration? That's a good point. So, Jack is suggesting it's, it's because higher summer insulation. And we know uh, last summer glacial had much higher summer insulation than the summer right now. 
because uh, the 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 Earth's orbit is more eccentric. So the summer at that time, but right now we have a cooler summer. Actually. At that time, they have a much much warmer. Summer. Is there any tectonic mm -hmm. differences, especially in Antarctica? Okay, yeah, and uh, I believe uh, if you look at uh, all the previous integration, and uh, they show uh, like uh, uh, the, the previous, cons like, like this synthesis, they show uh, 125,000 years year ago, it had like six to nine. Mm -hmm. Then 400 thousand years ago, it's even higher. So what I mean is, uh, it's it's not clear the tectonics will go along with uh, yeah, with clear. the orbits, with the Earth's orbit. Yeah. I mean, I tend to think of. I'm just curious about like atmospheric circulation or ocean circulation differences, right? I mean, Antarctica in some ways is protected a bit because of this particularly strong southern hemisphere jet and relatively robust circulation. Like, you know, is there like some sort of breakdown that occurs at some point where like you start to see much more intrusion in your area and you're kind of making stuff up now? But like something that changes that allow Antarctic ice to melt a lot faster than we're seeing now because the current like weather system right now I think don't really support a lot of that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad I covered that too. <laughs> <laughs> so it's something like other than this warming. This is something else that uh, we, we are just discussing that uh, we typically don't think about it as a climatic force. So at least definitely not CO2. <laughs> That's, okay, so another summary. I mean, it's it's a little bit depressing, right? <laughs> we saw so many like uh, what we don't know. <laughs> so we are facing huge uncertainties of the future scenario of prediction, and uh, we want to look at something uh, in the past to find some clue. Then it's even more puzzling. <laughs> so actually, I think everyone knows this happens all the time for our research. It's always like that. It's not like uh, what you plan always happen. Uh, however, what else can you do? Maybe you can make it a, a promising <laughs> proposal, right? No, you have to have the problem solved before you go to the next We try three times. <laughs> OK, the motivation. So yeah. So it's the same model, right? If you want to predict future scenario, all right, you have to use model, and uh, it's the same model that uh, you basically we are doing right now. So one reason we don't know the ice sheet response right now is only because it's still very early for the development of ice sheet model. We think about climate modeling, like uh, it happened 30 years ago. Maybe 40, I mean, 1980, 70. So we are only doing the ice sheet modeling maybe only about a few, 10 years, 15 years. I mean, right now we still don't have a couple climate and ice sheet model that's uh, in like a production. It's only like in the development stage. So, however, with this new model, we have to benchmark it. So we have to verify it's good to do any reasonable prediction. And then we can propose that we constrain the future sea level rise by uh, actually uh, benchmarking the current uh, climate ice sheet sea level model with this uh, six to nine meter sea level rise during the last negotiation. So that, that's the, the, the proposed work. So <coughs> basically, what can you get? What can you possibly get from this work? One, you solve the problem, then you can explain the, what's the reason for the civil war rise during the last integration. Or you, you cannot solve it, 
then, then you try to find out what's wrong in the model. So that, that's kind of the exercise. For the climate modeler, as she modeler, basically that, that's what we are going to do. Um, so for phase one of this work, um, what we did is, so we do the climate model for the, for the last interglaciation. And uh, so Peter and I have been collaborating for a long time um, for this trend and climate simulation. So we did the trend and simulation for the last deglaciation and uh, the current deglacial. So it, it's not <coughs> a huge challenge for us to do the same simulation for the for the last interglaciation. So for this work, what we did is we started to run the simulation from the penultimate glacial maximum. Then we run through the whole deglaciation and then the last interglaciation. So that work took us almost four years. Mainly because we have to design the, the, the correct scheme and we try different uh, like fresh water forcing to make the model consented with uh, the, 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 the paleo climate reconstruction. So after this uh, almost, I think, a 30,000 year coupled RPCC climate simulation finish, then what we do is we ask uh, Nick Bulach from New Zealand to run the, the power line as she model for us to get the melting of the both Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets with our climate field. Uh, in addition, um, Nick proposed that because the current uh, ice sheet model has so many parameters that it is totally unconstrained. So what he did is he ran like a several thousand simulation with the whole parameter like a possibility, and then find the best one that uh, can reproduce the the last deglaciation and the current uh, uh, integration. No, just reproduce the current deglaciation of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet. So he used those parameter in the parallel ice sheet model to conduct this uh, offline ice sheet only simulation. So for those kind of work, there is one uh, caveat. So a lot of people have, have showed, if you don't couple the climate and ice sheet together, which we cannot do that right now for, for like a 20,000 year simulation, mainly because uh, the climate model is not coupled with the ice sheet model yet. Uh, but if you don't couple them together, you, you lose a lot of positive feedback. And that will underestimate the melting from the, like a, from the like surface mass balance. So that's one caveat there. So then after, uh, uh, Nick is an uh, ice sheet simulation for both Greenland and, uh, and uh, Antarctic. And uh, we want to verify our model is good to reproduce the sea level record. In order to do that, we need uh, a sea level model. Basically, it's a glacial isostatic adjustment, adjustment model actually to take into the change of the ice sheet topography and then to reproduce the sea level change globally uh, with uh, Jerry uh, Mitrovica's uh, Earth's, Earth's model. So here is one thing that I did not discuss, I did not discuss it. it the, the regional sea level change can be much, much different than the global sea level change because of the ocean circulation, because of the 
the the different like uh, the wind field, the warming of the, the different part of the ocean. So that's why also be called the, the, the tectonic, uh, not tectonic, this glacial isostatic adjustment. Like if you have a, if you change your ice sheet, then you like right now we know like maybe New Jersey is still rebounding upward because from the 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 retreat of the the ice sheet during the last glaciation. So those kind of a slow and the and the glacial isostatic adjustment has to be simulated in uh, in this first uh, model. And uh, now I'm going to show the result. So this is what we get from the, 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 the simulation of this uh, chain of the ice sheet. So what we get here is the, the, the main feature is we get the collapse of the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, Around this uh, last interglacial time, and uh, this is definitely a uh, surprising result for us. We, we never thought we could get a really good climate for that. And uh, in addition, so this uh, Greenland also contributed. Uh, I think uh, we only get about. Uh, uh, one meter of the, the deglaciation from the Greenland. And that's definitely uh, at an underestimate of the, the estimate from the, the data synthesis. And we think that's partly due to uh, we did this uh, offline coupling instead of uh, the direct coupling between the ice sheet model and the, the climate model. And now let's look at uh, what's called in, uh, this uh, uh, Western Antarctic ice sheet collapse. How quick does that rise? So that West Antarctic collapse, where it looks like that about 3,000 years where it stays at present day sea level before it kind of. That, yeah, and then that, right, and that's another couple thousand years, right? I'm looking at. So I believe this is uh, yeah. the current sea level. Yeah. So, yeah, it take about uh, two, two thousand, more than two thousand years. Okay. The forcing is much slower too. Right, right. Okay. 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 And also the the dating of the. The sea level record, sea level record also have huge gaps in it. So uh, it, it's not like uh, uh, you know it have to be exactly at that time. How big are your time steps? Uh, for the in the model. In the model, the climate model is uh, basically like uh, twenty minutes, thirty minutes. It's a typical IPCC climate model. <laughs> Yeah. Just name your hour and you'll get it. I mean, the ice sheet model can be run like a 5,000 in a few days. So it, it, the ice sheet model will be really quick. And uh, both the ice sheet model and the, the Earth model for the sea level have been run like 5,000 or 50,000. Uh, realization to do the estimate of uncertainty. Uh, we could not do that with a heavy model. So this is what happened. Exactly like uh, Anker suggested. It, it's <laughs> in the, what happened in the model is due to this oceanic forcing. So what's the oceanic forcing? So, it basically, if you have like a, it's a marine based like Western Antarctic ice sheet. So you, if you have like a warmer deep water get into like a, below the, the, the ice shelf, and uh, it can 
melt the the you know the bottom of the ash quickly. And uh, this uh, has been found in so many like, new uh, studies for the current climate change. I will show you uh, in a few minutes. But here I just uh, show you uh, what what's the, the meaning of this oceanic forcing uh, for the melting of the ice sheet. And then there are so many uh, feedbacks. Um, but uh, I think uh, it's a little bit less constrained. Uh, but this melting of uh, the bottom of the ice sheet is pretty uh, uh, And uh, so, so in the model, the subsurface warming actually is caused by this uh, so-called uh, heritage events in the Peru climate community. So what happened is when the long tide started to go away, the ocean circulation actually shuts down during that time. The exact reason is still debating. Um, maybe due to fresh water forcing, maybe not. However, the shutdown in more during the deglaciation is very robust. And uh, this so-called uh, uh, heritage events happen in both deglaciation, like uh, for the last interglacial, it's called penultimate deglaciation. For our current interglacial, it's called the last deglaciation. So basically, it happened. It, it, it almost always happened during the deglaciation. If you uh, accept the mechanism for the fresh water forcing of uh, AMOC shutdown, after you accept it, then it's all make, it, it all makes sense. So basically, you have melting of ice sheet, then it will go shut down anymore. However, there is a difference between our current, uh, between the last interglaciation, like happened like a, about 15, 40 years ago, and this uh, degla the penultimate deglaciation that happened about 130 or so years ago. The difference is, at that time, it's much, much longer. So the, like the AMOC, was shut down for the whole deglaciation, like the eight thousand year or seven thousand year. However, for the last deglaciation, it's only shut down about like half of that time. So the, here I just tell you the difference between the the AMOC response in those in those deglaciation before the two interglacial, and uh, it has already being confirmed both by our Sean Marco and the, the, the first truth paper by you and all that when you have a, a shutdown in wall, your south surface ocean actually warm. Because when you shut down in wall, it's so cold at the surface, you grow so many sea ice, so much sea ice. So basically the whole North Atlantic is covered by sea ice. And then this warming actually will cover the whole uh, subsurface ocean. This is uh, a little bit counterintuitive. However, if you remember our snow right now, it will make the subsurface warmer. It's the same reason. So the sea ice, all the snow actually basically act as a, a, a layer or as a kind of a power to reduce the, the heat out of the ocean or out of the ground. So this is a very kind of a, it's a not intuitive, but uh, it makes sense. And it's also confirmed by uh, a lot of uh, paleo record. And uh, that's what happened. So basically, during the last, so the, during the deglaciation, before the, the, the last interglacial, no, before the last interglacial, uh, the ocean actually have more time to accumulate heat. That's why it's much warmer. And that, that's the reason our current interglaciation 
we don't have the cleft of Western Antarctic ice sheet. However, during the last intergalaxiation, the South Pacific Ocean is warmer, and actually it, it, it melted the Western Antarctic ice sheet. That, that's the basically the, the, the major reason why we got Western Antarctic ice sheet cleft in the model for the simulation. Um, since the model is being run, the ICE model is being run offline, how sensitive is that to the precise temperature? In other words, if the temperatures are, you know, have an uncertainty of one degree C, how much of an effect does that have on the estimate of how much ice sheets melting? Um, I believe we, what we use actually is a, a normally method. So it's the, uh, we use the observation, then we put on the anomaly of, of uh, both last, last deglaciation and then the, 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 the anomaly of deglaciation. Right, so whatever you use though for that temperature, if it were like a tenth of a degree C warmer or a tenth of a degree C cooler, would it have a big effect on how much melting took place in Antarctica? I know for sea ice, it's really sensitive to that bottom melt temperature, oh. bottom water temperature. Yes. The, the, the ice shelf is also very sensitive. I believe uh, like you have one degree warming, it can melt like, uh, several meters deep, uh, I don't know, several years. So it's also very sensitive to the, to the subsurface warming. And you can see the warming actually is not on the edge of that target. So actually this warming is much, much smaller, but, uh, but uh, the ice sheet can feel it if you have a uh, like a longer time to melt it. Uh, this is a figure I promised to show you. Uh, so this is uh, the synthesis of our current uh, ice sheet of the, the ice sheet, something, uh, ice sheet like a balance. Uh, first, the circle is like a how much uh, ice loss uh, at each like, uh, ice stream location. Then for this study, they actually did a, a, a separation from, um, I believe, uh, one is from the, uh, it's called a uh, common of the, the ice sheet. This is like a, <coughs> it's from like a, a, a cleft of the ice sheet uh, on the side of the, the ice shell. Then the other, the dash line, no, no, the, what's in, this kind of, uh, the open sheeting actually is the, the melting from the, the south surface wall. Oh, actually, it's opposite. So this uh, cross sheeting is a common, and then this is from the melting. So the, the, the dark uh, shading is, is a melt, melt. So what, what this study show is the melting from some sort of warming almost contribute like half of the, the total Antarctic uh, ice sheet uh, melting based on the, the, the observation. So this is uh, just show this uh, subsurface uh, the oceanic forcing actually is uh, also consistent from our current operation. So like here, it said uh, about 50% of mass loss from Antarctic ice sheet is from oceanic forcing. And uh, then this is the take home uh, message. So basically, uh, the ice sheet is very sensitive to this uh, oceanic low below. And uh, that's why uh, if we want to uh, have a better understanding of future ice sheet change, then this is the one research area uh, we can do to have more um, observation, to do more uh, monitoring. Okay, thank you very much. That's a great discussion, but if there's any more follow-up questions from anybody?
Okay, I'll throw one at you from uh, social media. Um, <laughs> this morning, actually, one of my um, climate change denying Facebook acquaintances from okay. high school, I refuse to say friend, um, uh, basically posted an article from NBC News saying there's some Greenland glacier that's growing. I'm saying, well, this, of course, this screws all of climate change, but ignoring that part, um, yeah, what is going on? I mean, do you know, are you familiar with this article? I guess there's just some study that came out suggesting there's some areas of, of un unexpected growth in, in glacial mass in parts of Greenland. And the article then went on to say this has to be still the mass as a whole is losing, climate change is happening, etc. It was a good article, but I don't know if you saw that or if you know anything about that. Yeah, actually, um, uh, I will, with a related study to uh, estimate the, the surface mass balance for, uh, for Antarctic. Ba basically, there is this computation that uh, I, I actually knew even when I was a uh, graduate student. Mm -hmm. That the glacier grow like, due to uh, more precipitation in the warmer world all is going to melt due to uh, the temperature. So there are two like competing factors. So temperature and then precipitation. In a warmer world, you expect actually more precipitation in a high latitude. And you also expect more like a <laughs> warming. Like a <laughs> so that's why it's it's not easy. So we will have to use uh, some kind of a modeling, climate modeling to actually yeah. to find who is winning, which, which factor is, is winning. Yeah. Just just to follow up on that, from reading the, the applicant profiles, one of the persons coming in, I think, on the AOS side yeah. is been looking at sort of changes in the jet stream and how the changes yeah. must be delivered to different parts of the ice sheet. Mm -hmm. That might be the ice yeah. modeling. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. I, I know almost nothing about any of this, so I'm really glad I came. You gave a great talk. The uh, ice in the in the Atlantic, especially in the North Atlantic, at prior times, did that rev up or have no effect or decrease tropical cyclone activity in the subtropical Atlantic? Because your model is at every 20 minutes. You could probably <laughs> yeah, actually, it, it touches another uh, central piece of uh, paleoclimatology. So. I, I was still kind of uh, trying to make a proposal to do uh, the, the, the response of uh, Southern Hemisphere Wesley during the North Atlantic cold period. And the one thing for sure I know, uh, like right now, uh, so many people did the global warming scenario. So when you have a warmer hemisphere, your RTCV actually will be of uh, attracted to that mm -hmm. location. So it's the same thing right, right. when we have this uh, so-called high ridge events. And uh, the RTCV definitely moved to the warmer hemisphere. Mm -hmm. However, I still don't know the, so I know pretty sure RTCV moved southward mm -hmm. more to the southern hemisphere during like deglaciation when CO2 is getting out of the ocean. However, I don't know the, basically the controversy is whether your sun hemisphere Wesley also move along with your RTCV. Mm -hmm. So basically your coupling between your tropics and the, and the sun tropics. Um, because uh, that chain of sun hemisphere Wesley is supposed to uh, drive up the upwelling in the sun ocean to give you the CO2 in the atmosphere. And then that's the central part of the whole deglacial CO2 story. And uh, the current uh, consensus is the model don't get it. The model don't get the coupling between Sun Hemisphere Wesley and the, the RTCV. However, the data, almost most of the data actually show uh, uh, the Wesley will change. But uh, most of the data are oceanic data from sediments and uh, so there are different interpretations. So I yeah. wonder how the how the subtropical Atlantic is ventilated under those conditions. Yeah, that's that's exactly uh, the all the paleoclimate kind of uh, people are, are wondering too. 
because the, the ocean has all the carbon and that, that, that's uh, everyone, I mean, it's a holy grail of paleoclimatology. Where is the deflation CO2 from? All right, well, that was end and uh,